so my name is Martha Stroud, and I'm the Associate Director and Senior Research Officer at the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research. And on behalf of the center and our co-sponsor for this event, the USC Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies, I'm excited to welcome all of you. We'd like to begin by acknowledging that the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Tongva people, who are the traditional land caretakers of the Tovangar, which is the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands. Along with the Tongva, we also recognize the Chumash, Tataviam, Serrano, Kawia, and Peom Kawicham peoples for the land that USC also occupies around Southern California. We pay respects to their elders, past and present. So just a brief word about the Zoom protocols. After today's lecture, we're gonna have time for questions and discussion, and we really invite and encourage your participation, your comments and questions. Um, and it turns out to be one of the most fruitful parts of our events. So to participate, you can use the Q&A feature below. And during the lecture, we're gonna disable the chat, but after the lecture, we'll re-enable it so you can type questions into the chat. And you can also ask questions via audio by clicking the raise hand button, which you'll also find below. And I will uh, unmute you so you may ask a question live via audio. So when considering how to ask your question, please keep in mind that the event is being recorded and will be made widely available afterwards, including the discussion. So if you have concerns about privacy, maybe um, asking your question by chat or the Q&A feature would be preferable to asking your question on audio. So in the next two and a half weeks, the center is organizing or co-sponsoring three more events, um, which are listed here on the screen. We invite you to visit our website to learn more about the events and to register to attend. We're so grateful to all of you who attend our events regularly, those who are here for the first time, and we hope that you'll return again for our future events. So now to introduce today's lecturer and speaker, it is my pleasure to introduce the founding director of the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research, Professor Wolf Grutner. Thank you, Marta, uh, and welcome to uh, all of you out there in the virtual space. Um, thank you, Marta and Badema, for preparing everything which goes into uh, this event. Uh, this is uh, the 2020-21 um, Margie Douglas uh, Greenberg Research Fellow Lecture at the USC Shaw Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research. The center, uh, located at uh, the University of Southern California, provides an academic uh, program uh, which is very lively, uh, consisting of fellowships, uh, conferences, and other forms of uh, academic events. Uh, today, we are very thankful and grateful to the donors of this uh, fellowship, uh, Margie and Douglas Greenberg, who uh, not only um, gave the endowment so that we on an annual basis can invite young promising scholars to uh, USC, but also to, for their uh, frequent and regular support of the center in all its and all its endeavors. And we also thank uh, our co-sponsor for today's event, uh, the USC Dawn Sive Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies. So this year's uh, Margie and Douglas Greenberg uh, Research Fellow is Florian Sobranski. He is a PhD candidate uh, of the Weidenfeld Institute um, for German Jewish Studies at the University of Sussex in the UK. He earned his uh, master's uh, in sociology from the Goethe University in Frankfurt and his uh, bachelor in social economy from the University of Hamburg. His dissertation project is tentatively titled Male Jewish Intimacy and the Holocaust. 
By examining the sexuality and emotions of Jewish men, he hopes to highlight gendered and se sexualized dynamics in the na Nazi racial state and during the Holocaust in general. To provide fresh insights into the uh, cause and impact of genocidal violence. He is the recipient of several prestigious fellowships already early in his career, including the Josef Wolf Fellowship at the Center for uh, Holocaust Studies at the Institute for Contemporary History in Munich, uh, and the Airy Fellowship um, to the Wiesen, uh, Vienna Wiesenthal Center of Holocaust Studies in Yad Vashem. He presented uh, first results of his dissertation at a number of several academic conferences, including the uh, biggest um, co uh, conference on the Holocaust, um, the Lessons and Legacies, which were hosted for the first time in Europe in Munich. Florian is the author and co-author of several publications, some reviews, and uh, we are all looking forward to his first chapter on the topic of his research here, which is uh, tentatively titled um, Male Jewish Teenage uh, Sexuality in Nazi Germany, which will appear uh, hopefully this year uh, in uh, a volume which is uh, co-edited by uh, several scholars with the tentatively title, uh, If This is a Woman by Brookline Academic Studies Press. So it is my distinct pleasure to hand over to Florian, uh, give him a warm um, hand of applause. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And with, and hello to everyone and good morning to the US and good evening from Germany where it also actually is, um, just started snowing but I don't think it'll um, stick. And I'm thrilled about the opportunity to present um, some of the findings of last month's research as a Margie and Douglas Greenberg Research Fellow at the USC Shoah Foundation. Before I start my presentation, I would like to thank the team of the Center for Advanced Genocide Research for the very warm welcome and support during my virtual stay in LA. Although I could not be there in person, my research has benefited greatly from the access to oral history interviews and our ongoing talks during the last month. So thank you, Wolf, Martha and Vadima, but also Lauren, who was a fellow with me at the time and who pre presented her very um, important um, work and research two weeks ago. I would also like to extend my thanks to Ita Gordon and Crispin Brooks, who provided invaluable support in terms of indexing, in indexing terms and the search for interviews, which are of interest to my topic of male Jewish intimacy during the Holocaust. A talk with Paul Lerner and Lauren was also very helpful to gain thought-provoking input for my research. Before also I, I start the presentation, I would like to issue a content warning as my presentation deals with rape and sexualized violence. And also, um, I don't have PowerPoint slides, um, but I will play some clips later um, of the Visual History Archive. Today's talk starts with a short overview of my doctoral project before I briefly reflect on my research at the center. I have written in the announcement for the talk today that I will present my research on ghettos and partisans, However, I decided now to only focus on partisans and um, resistance fighters who fought the Germans. My sincere apologies if you expected to learn insights about the ghettos today. I will also pr provide a background and contextualization of Jewish partisan warfare during the Holocaust and examine sexual encounters among the partisans. Finally, I analyze in depth segments of an interview with a former Jewish partisan as a case study, excavating how he narrates rape and sexualized violence. This also includes some reflections on the interview itself, such as gender dynamics and silences. So for my doctoral research. In my thesis, I examine the intimacy and agency of male Jews during the Holocaust. I have not finalized yet my conceptual framework of intimacy but I am interested in the private sphere of Jewish men during um, persecution. This can include, among others, exercises of masculinity linked with intimacy, such as fatherhood, the, the negotiation of contraception or abortion, the emotion of love, queer relations, sexual relations, 
but also sexual barter, friendships, closeness, nakedness, and intimate violence against the body, such as the shaving and cutting of beards, the loss of sexuality and virility, rape and sexualized violence against, but also perpetrated by Jewish men. By linking these aspects with agency, I explore how men acted, made decisions, and behaved in various ways. It is important to state that neither intimacy nor agency, in my understanding, are inherently, inherently positive concepts. They can be, but they might be also um, associated with sexualized violence, for instance. My thesis consists of four substantial chapters and spaces, namely ghettos, concentration camps, partisans, and Jewish resistance. However, I'm not looking at um, Jewish resistance in, in the ghettos or camps, but in the forest and woods, mainly um, in Belarus and the Soviet Union. And finally, in my last chapter, the aftermath um, and displaced persons camps. In terms of sources, I use diaries, memoirs, testimonies, and court documents, and also oral history interviews, such as of the Visual History Archive here at USC, um, which I will refer to in the fol following as VHA. Despite the fact that my thesis centers on men, I also integrate the female gaze on men into my work by considering gender as relational categ category of analysis. And um, these sources illuminate their view and understanding of male con conduct and add pertinent perspective to my project. So what have I been doing over the last few weeks as a research fellow at the center? My research comes with the challenge, ch challenge that many archives have not yet indexed the topics and terms I'm, I'm searching for. In the, indeed, I discover many interesting sources, for example, and testimonies by chance through extensive reading or to provide an example, specific digging at places like um, the Aktion Reinhardt Camp Sobibor where a work commando of female and male Jews stayed alive and were not killed immediately upon arrival. Some of these women and men engaged in romantic and sexual relationships, which I include in my work. A further challenge is my thematic or theme-centered approach. I don't explore intimacy and agency in a specific camp or ghetto, but work with the given sources and contextualize them in their specific space and time. For my doctoral project, the VHA provides invaluable material. Not only do survivors of the Holocaust speak about intimate topics, but many segments in the interviews are also indexed. They consist of love, friendship, friendships, which also include romantic relationships, but also jealousy, gay male sexual activities, which rather depict sexualized violence by carpus against young boys or men, sexual activities, sexual assaults in different spaces, such as camps or ghettos, ghetto childbearing, female resistance fighters, refugee camp marriage, which is interesting for me for the DP camps. And this is a non-exhaustive list of terms I was working with over the last month. The fact that I had the opportunity to work for one month intensively in an archive was extremely helpful um, for finding patterns and overarching narratives. They are um, not all new, of course, um, and most of them have been stated by research already. But, um, but, but just to uh, mention the, the blatant um, homophobia in the accounts on sexualized violence perpetrated by carpus against men, which is mainly explained by homosexuality and ignores aspects of power relations and status. Status privilege and gender stratifications also become apparent regularly in the interviewed, interviews, which I will um, also return to later in the presentation. Excuse me. I will continue now with a brief contextualization of Jewish res resistance. Partisans were resistance fighters who fought the Germans. In my thesis, I distinguish between armed resistance in the ghettos or camps and warfare, warfare in non-confined spaces, such as the vast woods and forests in the Ukraine and Soviet Union. For many Jews who were not incarcerated in camps or ghettos or had escaped, 
often their only means of survival was to join a group of partisans oper operating in the area. Partisan warfare was characterized by quick movements of highly equipped units with the aim of destroying the means of communication, bridges, railroads, or trains. The partisans often consisted of former Red Army soldiers or locals. In the Nalibuki forest in Belarus, an all Jewish partisan unit existed, formed by the Bilski brothers, who not only engaged in partisan warfare, but also provided safety and shelter for Jews who escaped the Germans. Between 1941 and 1944, around half a million women and men fought as partisans in the torrid territory of the Soviet Union. It is estimated that all over Europe, around 30,000 Jews were active partisans. Prevailing anti-Semitism made it often difficult for Jews to um, join the groups. Jewish men had to demonstrate that they were earnest fighters and they were often considered as cowards or traitors. Jewish women were also often rejected as the Germans had spread the rumor they were carrying sexually transmitted diseases. Not more than two to 5% of the partisans were female, albeit seldom in fighting positions. They were rather scouts or obtained intelligence. In a VHA interview, Sulia Rubin recounts, and I quote her, a girl in the woods was a burden. She wasn't considered a soldier. Another Jewish woman, Isia Shoah, states in an interview that she was trained with the use of wep weapons and fought with Soviet partisans. When she, when she joined the Bilski brothers, however, she was spared from using them. Among this Jewish group, only young men were sent out to raid villages for food or weapons and engaged in acts of sabotage. When the Germans retreated from the Red Army, Isia Shor wanted to join the fighting, but her fa father was strictly opposed to it and urged her not to leave him alone. Nevertheless, she, she joined the other men. Other interviewees state that women were assigned with attributed female corps, such as work in the kitchens. Thus, it can be assumed that in the woods, traditional gender orders and hierarchies were not only reproduced, but, but amid genocidal violence became even more severe. Gendered stratifications become also apparent in sexual relations. This was evident not only in the relationships themselves, but also the terms attributed to it. In the Bilski group, men in a relationship were called Tavo. Women without um, a relationship and or useful skills, in contrast, in, in contrast, by Bush. Both are Hebrew um, words, and in her interview, um, Sulia Rubin explained um, that a Malbush, which would be usually um, a clothing, um, is like and she, she says, a suit without a human being in it. Whereas Tavo, in contrast, has a posit positive meaning, which could be understood as, come here. Thus women without a man were considered empty and without any essence, while the man's expected role in approaching women and forming a relationship is highlighted by its active connotation. While in Soviet partisan groups, relationships were usually forbidden, they still existed. The Bilski partisans, in contrast, were not so strict and many relationships developed. In an VHA interview, the interviewer asks Lisa Leibel about sexual, sexual relations in the group and she states, a lot of boys, you know, met girls and they decided to live together. She also remembers that some children were born and couples married after 1945. Rival further claims that, and she, she says, some girls were looking for an easier life. Motivations for women to engage in relationships, asserts Rival, were better food provisions, security, um, but women also engaged in relationships in order to have company. Um, turning to men now, in another interview, the interviewer asked Jeffrey Crador also explicitly about sexual relations in a Jewish group of partisans. Initially, he declines its, its existence, but slowly opens up to the topic and recounts sexual enc encounters. 
and he says, maybe somebody else did, but in my case, I was too young. And he further explains that he was in his teens at the time and says, I was naive, I was a virgin. I didn't know what means a woman yet. And then Crado also remembers that the commander lived together with a woman and that the commander asked her to marry him after the war, but he, he does not know what actually happened to them. Other interviewees talk about a young man who caught venereal, venereal disease, the negotiation of reproduction, such as the consequences of birth and uh, ab abortions. Um, when, when, or because when commanders um, either demanded to kill newborn babies or ask um, the, the couples to, to actually leave the groups. Um, but interviewees also speak about young partisans' um, sexual inexperience um, or the need of a relationship to avoid unwanted, un unwanted advances. Most relationships, however, were characterized by intimate barter. And this bar barter was usually sh shaped by inequalities as women were in dependent um, positions. As the men went on, ra on raids, they were able to share and barter their exploits, such as food or clothes for intimacy. Many interviewees linked the barter with survival and protection of women. Interestingly, they placed their focus only on the women, silencing um, the behavior and conduct of men. And although I'm re researching men, also just now I'm focusing a lot of, 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 of women. Um, and I'm also, so I'm, um, so, so Sonja Urbuch joined Soviet partisans with, with her family. There were also some, some Jewish men who provided her with clothes. The wife of the commander gave her an advice that resembles the hierarchies among the partisans. And this is a longer quotation now. I was a rarity. I was a Jewish girl surviving with the family, but the women with the partisans had it very bad. And then the interviewer asks, in what sense? There, there were men and women, you know, how can I tell? When I came in, I was a young girl and the wife of the commander called me in and she said to me, Sonia, this is a partisan group. I can advise you to get acquainted with a lieutenant or captain or whatever. You will be better off. The man will leave you alone. And then the interviewer requires rape, you say? And then she, she answers, I wouldn't say rape, but it happened all the time, you know, but I was lucky. I was with my family. I was never approached. However, at, at, the, at that um, same time, she still claimed that she had a boyfriend. And in, in the interview, Orbuch is also reluctant to speak directly about the relationships. So she only refers to the topic at a later segment again, and specifies what the wife of the commander actually recommended, um, recommended to her. Um, and, and, and she said, if you take up with anyone, it should be a commander, then you have a better life, indicating the privileges some higher ranking man could offer. And when Sulia Rubin in another interview um, recounts how she joined the Bilski group, she, she wanted to be with a man as she remembers. And she says, this is also a longer quotation. To find a guy was very easy, but to find a guy that would protect you and stay with you. Um, I was horribly afraid of pregnancy because I faced a few friends had abortions or had in the six month an abortion. And you didn't, nobody raped you. Nobody forced you, don't get me wrong. Nobody forced anybody. They tried and you couldn't blame a guy for trying but they did not force. And then couples slowly got together. If one was killed, she looked for another one. But without a man, there was survival. There were people who survived if you wanted to go hungry all the time. Rubin stresses the apparent women's need of an intimate relationship um, that provided protection, food, and survival. One of the men proposed to her, and while her father agreed, her mother was strictly opposed to the marriage and accused her that she had, quote, sold herself and that she will, also another quote, will never leave him again. And in fact, Rubin agreed with her mother actually, but insisted it was her decision and that she was, and also at the time of the interview, fine with it. And she says, 
I built my life around this man, and it's a good life. Sonia Bilski, Lee Boulder, who married one of the Bilski brothers, also remembers intimate barter in the Bilski group. I, and she says, I don't blame that either, because a woman, just a girl, she was by herself. She needed a pair of shoes. She needed a sweater. She needs something. So she was looking for a man, then another man, till she finds something what she liked. End of the quote. So out of the 12 interviews in English about sexual activities among partisans, um, six are by men. However, they do not talk about the barter of intimacy for necessities. Nevertheless, the three examples I provided here are very instructive. While the conduct of men remains hidden in first sight, they il illuminate a high dependency of women by men, be it for clothing and food, thus for survival. Men could provide for the women because they went on raids, bearing women from joining. And this, of course, reproduced and stabilized gender stratifications and created extreme um, inequalities among the sexes. These were literally man-made, man-made, so to say. And I want to put forward some pre preliminary suggestions what these interviews can tell us about male Jewish intimacy among the partisans. But I'm, I'm referring here in, in particular to the Bilski group because all of those three interviews um, or interviewees were with the Bilski brothers. Male privilege was not distributed equally. Older men or men who did not join the fighting were also in a lower hierarchical position and maybe dependent on other family members or friends. Young men who encountered women and apparently one of the Bilski brothers saw several at a time proved their virility and manliness. What is more, men who had sex demonstrated their status in the group, which was in particular relevant in partisan groups with only a few women. Still, the male gaze is missing in this regard, contributing to the silence how men exer actually exercised their sexual power. Excuse me. I'm turning now um, to, to the case study and will analyze two short segments of a, of a video in depth. I have also prepared two video clips, which I will share in a minute. The interview was conducted with Michael Begum on 19, 19th of October, 1969 in LA. Begum was born on the 22nd of June, 1922 in a small shtetl called Parafyanava around 150 kilometers um, north of Minsk, which belonged then to the Soviet Union and is today the capital of Belarus. His family was observant, but not very religious. After the German invasion and attack on the Soviet Union, the occupiers created a ghetto in Parafyanava. In May 1942, when a commando of the Einsatzgruppen, mobile German killing squads, surrounded the ghetto and killed most of its dwellers, including Begum's sister and parents, Begum escaped to the forests. After wandering around for three months, he encounter, encountered a group of Soviet partisans. They initially refused him for fearing he was a German spy, but accept, accepted him after he killed a number of Germans in Parafyanava with hand grenades. In 1944, with the arrival of the Soviet forces, Begum joined the Red Army. In 1949, he migrated to the United States. Amidst the war and genocidal violence, Begum remembers an intimate incident, which I would consider as sexualized violence. However, Begum himself and the interviewer seem to assess the situation differently. And I will play the clip now, but bear with me for one second. You told us a pretty funny story earlier before we actually began filming. You don't remember what you told us about the minions? Should I tell you? Oh, that? of course. Okay, we we're coming from a mission, and uh, 
the skull in the same 10 or 15 below zero. We were cold, and we had to walk another 10 miles to our camp. And we saw an isolated farmhouse, which are built usually one big room. It's called Izba. And I said, guys, let's sleep over here. The Germans are only 10, 15 miles away from here, so I don't think so they'll go out in a cold night like that. So we, we knocked on the door, the door was open, a very healthy, I, mean, I wouldn't say the shoes are a, a beauty or anything, you know, but the uh, shoes built for comfort. <laughs> and she went to the barn and brought some hay and she spread everything on the, on the floor we went to sleep. And I happened to sleep the last one, I was the, I was the tenth man, there were ten of us. And about four in the morning, the guy next to me, the Russian guy, woke me up and he says, it's your turn. <laughs> I said, do you need a tent for a minion? <laughs> and he said, что такое минион? Что ты говоришь? And I said, what, what the hell are you talking about? What's a minion? <laughs> I said, thank you. <laughs> Seems to me that she didn't mind. Obviously, the other men didn't. The men didn't mind either. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The interviewer then starts a sentence to inquire more about the women, but changes the question to learn more about partisan activities thus averting the female perspective and potential sexualized violence. Indeed, we learn nothing about the woman, but it can be assumed that she was running the farm by herself while her man was either fighting with the Red Army, was snatched by the Germans for forced labor or had been killed. And for the co context, Minion is the number of 10 men to constitute a Jewish um, religious service. Listening to the clip, one can only assume the intimate nature of the incident. Begin refers to the appearance, of the appearance of the woman and in doing so sexualizes her. However, what actually happened remained silenced and vague. In particular, a critical reading of the event as potentially violent and forceful is brushed aside by Begin and the interviewer reveals through their laughter which seemingly makes the situation involving the 10 men and one woman a laughing matter. As the interviewer refers to a pr pretty funny story, Begum apparently told beforehand he must have had referred to the story already before the interview. Taking the statement at face value, many questions remain. A woman by herself in an isolated farmhouse was arguably in a vulnerable position not only towards the 10 male partisans. And broadening the an an analysis to think beyond consent and coercion, the woman could have found herself embedded in the environment of violence, war, and genocide. To sexually engage with the women, it can be assumed no further violence or force had to, had to be perpetrated by the partisans. And under the circumstances, the women choose to subjugate to them. Taking the agency of the women and men seriously allows a critical analysis that overcomes the static dichotomy of consent and coercion, coercion and penetrates further possible readings of the situation. Nevertheless, since we don't know the perspective of the women and with the given information, there are certain indications that sexualized violence was perpetrated by the partisans. And Brigitte Halbmeier laid out an analytical fra framework of sexualized violence, which I find really helpful, that takes power and various forms of violence, such as humiliations or intimidations also into account. So why do I argue that this is a case of sexualized violence? First, Begum did not engage with the women directly, but was told by a third person it was his turn, as he says, suggesting that the woman could not choose by herself who to be intimate with. Second, 
it seems very unlikely that the women simply, and um, in quotation marks, voluntarily agreed to have intercourse with 10 men in a row she pr presumably did not know. Rather, it is plausible that she subjugated to the men due to their power and violence, they were able to perpetrate or poss possibly we, we don't know this had perpetrated. Third, it is also unlikely that Barta was at play, which, which usually would have involved less people. But what is clear, Begin was not only oblivious to the power relations and gender stratifications at the time, but neither during the interview, and thus was not able to consider it as a possible act of sexualized violence. Nevertheless, Begin demonstrated male Jewish sexual agency in choosing not to get involved and have his turn. However, his motivations and thoughts remain hidden. In the interview itself, he initially seems reluctant to, to speak about the, about the occurrence on tape and has to be encouraged by the interviewer to go ahead. Thus, the interviewer, in contrast to Begum, deems it an appropriate topic to openly talk about. Although Begum only provides an abridged interpretation of the, of the situation and neglects its possible sexualized violent nature, the intimate character of the incident still counters the hero heroic narrative of fighting, suffering, and survival linked with partisan warfare. Yet, although unintentionally, Begin provides a glimpse into the overwhelming homosocial environment dominated by male partisans, who affirmed the heterosexuality and stressed the virility and potency in their encounter with the women at the farm. Finally, in referring to theories of rape and sexualized violence, I also suggest understanding the incident as an act of partisans conquering the peasant's body. And by, by, by that, I mean the lo local population. And in doing so, demonstrating military strength and their fighting masculinity. While this incident is not framed as sexualized violence by Begum, in, an, in another segment, he does talk about rape and that the perpetration of rape by partisans was punished by death. So one second again. I will. But in terms of even... But in terms of even within the partisan group, no I mean, relationship whatsoever. One, it was forbidden in any way to commit rape. If this took place, there was usually death penalty. It was a martial, court martial, and death penalty by shooting. Very strict, for one major reason: we needed the support and trust of the local population, because any partisan movement, any guerrilla movement cannot exist without the support of the local population. So we will make sure that we will not antagonize. And as a matter of fact, I'll tell you one incident. A good friend of mine, a Russian boy, did commit rape. And his bad luck that the father of the girl was one of our agents, which we didn't know about. And they brought him blindfolded, of course, in the forest, and they lined us all up, and the girl passed by, and she pointed at him and said, that's the guy. It was a court martial, and he was, well, I'm sorry, and he was sentenced to die. But we got a petition, we went to the commander, and I was one of the spokesmen, and I said, he is one of the best fighters, and he has the best record in fighting the Germans. And why should you waste his life? Let him go and kill some Germans. In other words, he himself should go and kill some Germans, and if he gets killed, 
it's better to die this way. The fact that rape was punished by death indicates that it occurred regularly. That this is what, what, what I suggest. And because partisans were dependent on the trust and support of the local population in order to survive, discipline and good relations between the local population and the partisans were thus paramount. This clip also shows that the partisans did not always follow um, their own rules. When Begum and other men asked the commander to refrain sentencing the partisan as he was a good fighter. To add to that, Begum describes the person as a good friend of mine. The commander agreed and the sentenced man was sent to a mission, sophisticatedly planned by Begum to blow up several Germans. Successfully doing so, the convicted rapists, rapists spared his death. Later in the interview, when the interviewer inquired about the man, and Begins simply answers, and I quote him, when you're 18, you are immortal. This, this narrative at the same time subordinates women and stresses the relevance of being a fearless masculine fighter. Indeed, fighting and killing Germans was considered to be more important than the bodily integrity of women. In their support of the sentenced man, Begum and other partisans highlight their complicity of sexualized violence, in this case rape, and the fact that the women did not account too much in their opinion. They created a hierarchy which did not have space for the straits of the local population and had the power to overrule their own policy, which in, in theory clearly stated the consequences of rape. In connecting and analyzing the two segments, one can examine two narr narratives. While the rape of the peasant's daughter is clearly acknowledged as such, the man found a way to overcome the death sentence and placed the convicted man's fighting abo um, ability above anything else. In contrast, the description at the farmhouse leaves um, more room for interpretation. Begin clearly does not frame it in the context of rape, but I argue it should be understood as sexualized violence, maybe even possible rape. What is more, these episodes also shed light on the general atmosphere of perceived moral standards, violence, and complicity. All that counted for the partisans was to survive and fight Germans. Rape, as much of the research on war and rape has shown, was merely considered a byproduct um, of the fighting. Considering the sexual agency of Begin, he remained surprisingly passive in the farmhouse, neither joining nor condemning their actions, but takes a leading role in saving the man sentenced to death. Here and throughout the interview, he usually depicts himself rather active. In the following, I would like to discuss the dynamics be between Begem and the interviewer. Through her behavior, I argue, um, she becomes an ally of Begem and his narrative. In particular, they're laughing about the incidents at the farmhouse and that potentially involved sexualized violence makes it impossible to ask follow-up questions and examine the full extent of the situation. While the interviewer asks about the convicted man in the rape incidents, nothing is known about the informant's daughter or the informant himself and how they perceived the idiosyncratic interpretation of the conviction. The interview itself further has to be considered as a gendered space in which social dynamics might lead to different ways certain topics are talked about. While Dorota Klovatska suggests male survivors might be more inclined to speak to women about sexualized violence perpetrated against them, it could be also argued that the interview as a um, masculine game, and this, this, this term masculine um, game is a term by um, German sociologist um, Silke Scholz, um, opens up the opportunity to speak about sexuality in general, rather in a homosocial space among, um, space among men. To add to that, interviewees presu presumably open up to male or female interviewers according to context, 
the dynamics of the interview, for example, trust, and also their general willingness to actually speak about intimate topics. This single interview is a good example on how to reconsider and pose critical questions to narratives in oral history interviews. Fleeting hints or half sentences can be easily overheard and not deemed significant. Especially the narrative of the farmhouse invites to miss the relevance of the situation or entirely included from the analysis as much of the pertinent information is missing. As a consequence, an event of potential sexualized violence remains silenced. A rereading of ambiguous statements and implicit allusions is paramount, not only in excavating incidents of sexualized violence, but also intimacy in general. For example, the aforementioned intimate barter or gender stratifications among the partisans. Scholars of the Holocaust, even without a specific focus on gender or sexualized violence, could also use such fleeting hints or comments in order to integrate into their research and writing events that constituted an important experience of Jews during the Holocaust. Thank, thank you very much for your attention. Florian, thank you so much. If we were all together in a room, we would all be clapping now. So thank you. Okay, I'm going to re-enable the chat. And just as a reminder to offer your questions, maybe your comments on the case study that Florian just analyzed or um, to participate, you can click the, the raise hand button to ask a question via audio. You can type questions into the Q&A feature uh, down at the bottom or into the chat. And my colleague Bedema will um, help to read the questions aloud for the sake of the recording and so Florian can answer them. So any questions or comments? While we're waiting for some participation, Florian, I was interested in your analysis of the laughter of the interviewer in the case study that you analyzed. And I was thinking, so I'm trained as an anthropologist and you know, have done a lot of qualitative interviews about mass violence and, and, the, and its aftermath. And I was thinking, I wonder in what way, I think you're very insightfully exploring the dynamics between the interviewer and the interviewee there. But I also wonder in what way might the interviewer be employing laughter to show the interviewee that she is not judging the story that she's trying to elicit. Um, and that while you're reading it as complicity um, with his narrative, I also wonder to what extent is it a kind of soft, uh, soft eliciting of that story by showing that she's kind of on his side in the, in the telling of it? I, I, I totally agree um, that this, this, this can certainly be the case. And by you formulated the question, I was also thinking maybe it's also an un uncomfortability that, that she might be also un un uncomfortable ab ab about it now. But yeah, I, 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 will need to, I will need to think about this more, but this is also an important point. Yeah. Um, okay. I believe we have a raised hand, uh, Georgia Craddock would like to ask a question. So Georgia, I will uh, unmute you now. Hi, thank you so much. Um, that was such an interesting lecture. I found it really, really cool. Thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering, um, as a student writing my master's dissertation this year on the female experience of forced sex labor and rape, um, what would you have you any tips on any keywords when searching for primary sources? Because I'm struggling to find them at the minute, and yours was so rich and detailed. Um, it would be really helpful. <laughs> um, so sorry, can, can I ask where, where are you looking at the moment? Um, where, I've where are you tried... doing... Sorry. <laughs> no, yeah. This, this was my um, question I've, already. 
looked at um, oral histories through the, um, is it the Usham Foundation um, and various other sources, but I only speak English, so a lot of them tend to be in German. I was just wondering if you knew of any, um, any obvious ones that I was missing. <laughs> No, but you, you could try the USC Shoah Sh Foundation because they have, I think, th around 3,000 th um, in interviews pu publicly available. And with, with the search ter terms of um, sexual assault, se sexual assault fears, um, you, you will find, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure, some interviews. And also um, Lauren's talk from two weeks ago, I, I don't know if you heard it, it it's online now, so you can, can also, also listen to this, which, which might give you some ideas. And then... They very briefly, um, Yad Vashem and the Ghetto Fighter House, for, for instance, they have a lot of material on, on, on digitized and online. And if you use the different um, search words like rape, sexualized violence in this direction, I'm pretty sure that you um, sh should find some more material. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. No worries. All right, we have another raised hands. I will start with people who actually want to ask a question directly and then we'll switch to chat. So another raised hand is by Esther Mayers. So Esther, I'm gonna unmute you now. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah. Uh Thank you so much. Uh, my mother was a partisan in the forest and um, she gave me a very detailed story about her experience there for the two and a half years, um, a woman alone. Um, uh, but the one thing she never covered and I always suspected and wondered was whether she had been raped. Um, so you talk a, a little bit about the Bielskis. Uh, she wasn't with the Bielskis, but she was in that area and on her own and with others and also with Russian groups. Uh, she could pass as a Russian because of her linguistic abilities. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you come across any of the Russians in the forest and whether um, there was what the sexual dynamics were in those groups. Yes, um, I, I would be un uncomfortable to um, come up with, with numbers or, or any, any, anything now and like a general female experience because of this would be difficult and I wouldn't be able um, to do it. But in, in, in the interviews, um, what, what I hear, it, 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 um, it's re it really differed. Um, some women were treated well, like this um, example, which I um, um, stated in the beginning that I think she was called Isia Shore, but that she was trained with the, with the weapons and that she had a good um, position with the Soviet or with the Russian partisans. But then other women talk about that, that they needed the, the sort of protection, like from a husband or from a man. But in, in, in the cases which I came across, when they said like, okay, I, I am in, in a relationship, it, 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 it should have been, been all right. But I also need to do more, more digging here and to find more sources to, to, to also answer more confidently and maybe also broaden um, my an analysis here. Yeah, and my mother also spoke, oh, my mother also spoke of the fact that she was um, reduced to uh, digging for potatoes and given, uh, as she called it, women's work. And then they realized how smart and capable she was and they gave her a gun and she went out on the sorties to, as she called it, do damage to the Deutsch. Uh, was that uh, a very unusual thing for a woman to be given that kind of, um, I guess you would say respect? I, I, I think it always depended on, on the particular situation. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that some Soviet crew, groups were, were maybe better with that and like it, it integrated women better than others or also than, 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 than the Bilski um, brothers. But, but also here again, I would need to, to do more, more, more research to, to, to be able to answer like more broadly. But I think it's, it's always like in, we have to look at those individual cases because it depends on time, it depends on, 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 on the place. And, it, and I think also 
and the, the commanders pl play a really big um, role of like how also their men be behave. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Uh, and I will now read a few questions from the chat. Um, so there is, okay. Um, a question, I don't seem to see the name. Um, so this person is ask, asking, I'm firstly wondering about Begum's comment about the women in the first interview passage. He says, um, something like, I think she didn't mind. How do you interpret this comment? And secondly, uh, I wonder about the way he presents his own role in this incident. Can you really be sure he was passive and didn't take the opportunity? Uh, or could you also interpret this as a way for him to be able to relate the story? And this is from Regina Mulhauser from Hamburg. Um, thank you, Regina. Um, this is um, re really important, and I, I, I will start um, with, 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 the, with the second question, because of course we, we, we don't know whether he's telling the, the, the truth that, that, that he that didn't join in. And when, when I only or when we only would take it at face value, we also wouldn't go very far. So this is why I started in inter predating um, the, the, this video and put my an, an analysis um, over there. But um, to, to be fair, like when, when he was also talking about the, the tenth, tenth minion and like this, the, this detailed um, re recollection, I, 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 I would be believe him here and would suggest that he didn't join in. But of course, I, I, I don't know. Um, but I, I, I will think about um, the, the, this, the, this more. And but when he says, I, I, I think um, she didn't mind. And then the, the interviewer says, I, I don't think that the man might mind it either. Maybe this is also a, a way um, for him to, to, to deal with the situation or, or what happened here, or also to, to make sense of it. And, and yeah, but yeah, it, 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 it's difficult. I, I also need to think about um, the, the small, but yeah. Yeah, sorry. Thanks, Florian. So the next question is from Sarah and Ernst. Uh, she's saying, thank you for your talk. It was extremely informative. When choosing to explore exercises of masculinity, does your framework come through a specific Jewish lens or through the European nations, such as German or Soviet ideals? And th th this is a, a, a very good question, but this is al also not something I'm doing at this um, point. But, but I think it's really interesting because of, of we, we have those the different na nations at that time, but, but most Jews were also so sort of excluded from, from, from the, the, those nations. And when, when I started also my studies, I was also al always wondering why do they speak always of Jews and Poles or, or Jews and... Um, Russians also, so that they, they never really seem to belong. Um, so, so I think it's also not really feasible for, for me at this point, also during um, um, annihilation and, and, and genocide to, 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 do, to do this, but I, I, I will need to also think about this. All right, um, a question by our fellow, uh, your fellow fellow. Uh, Lauren Cantillon, uh, she's saying, thank you, Florian. Did you find any other instances of off record or external to the official interview space conversations that were referenced by interviewers as a way of getting those stories on record? So, so, so sorry, could you re re repeat this question, please? Uh, did you find any other instances of off record um, conversations uh, that took place before the interview and then came into the interview space that were referenced by interviewers as a way of getting those stories on record? Um, no, I haven't. And I also have looked um, at the PIQ of the, so the pre-interview questionnaire, and I, I, I didn't find anything there in there, but what I came across, but not with the partisans, no, but um, sometimes in the breaks when they changed the, the tapes, 
that that someone is um, saying some something like in this. I, I don't know how long it takes to to change those tapes, but I I, I came across it once. And the interviewer then asks the person, could, could you please repeat what you just told me? And that this is also about sexuality. So, so I came across this once, but it's not before the interview, it's like during the interview when they change the tapes. Mm -hmm. um, we have another raised hand. So uh, Paula Opperman would like to ask a question. So Paula, I will allow you to speak now. Hi, it's actually Philip Dinkelacker sharing the screen with Paula Oppermann uh, here. Hi, Florian. Nice to see you. <laughs> hey, Paula. Thanks for the talk. It's super interesting and uh, yeah, also a he heavy topic. <laughs> um, I was really wondering, um, so thanks for this very in-depth analysis of the one interview. I think it's super important to, to have these case studies and to really look into it and to uh, yeah, um, move it around and, and look at it from different perspectives. And it was very interesting to uh, uh, listen to you, um, how, how you did that. So I really liked that. Um, I, I was wondering about his role in the story as well. And I think maybe maybe you will write about that. I mean, of course, the, uh, the talk is in uh, a short version of uh, maybe you, you, you already wrote about this, but his role in the story seems to me a bit, um, I mean, he suggested to sleep there and it's not that far away from their camp. So they know the area. Um, we don't know. I mean, of course we will never find out, but I think this is interesting for his perspective in the story. Also the way he presents it, he suggested that 10 people go to a hut. They don't know who's in there. They, they are partisans. They just don't knock somewhere. This, this could be a collaborator or anything. So he might've known that this woman is in there. And um, he describes her also in a funny way. Um, not, not funny, but you know, he, he, he's judging her. He's judging her, her beauty, her, her body. And um, so I think this is important that he suggested uh, that they should enter this hut to sleep there. Um, also the, the part of the getting warm and so on. So I think this is an important part. Um, and I also, wonder about the rape thing. Yeah, of course it was forbidden. It was forbidden in the Red Army. It was forbidden in all the partisan units, but still they raped, uh, they raped many, many women, for instance, in Berlin. They, they raped communist resistance fighters when they liberated the camps and the commanders had a very big problem to stop them. They shot, they shot thousands of Red Army soldiers between the Vistula and Berlin for, for committing rape, but they didn't get it under control up until some, some later parts in the war. Um, so I think um, I think the aspect that that has not been discussed yet is the, but you said it yourself. But it's also the ethnic uh, the ethnic confrontations in certain parts of Eastern Europe. I, I think they are important. If it's uh, the Poles against the Ukrainians, the Jews against the Poles, the Poles against the Jews, so on. So this this idea of revenge and who earns it and who doesn't, because it's a it's a big difference if it's a, a you know, a Red Army unit, a Red Army partisan unit from, from central Moscow or a, a, a sort of collaborator women. Maybe it was not forbidden to rape the collaborators, you know? So that's, that's my idea about that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, for um, the, the first point to raise, I think this is, this is really important also um, linking it with um, linking it with um, what um, Regina Mühlhäuser um, also said before. So I, I, I will really put, put a lot of um, thought, thoughts about it and, and that, that it was forbidden. Um, I came across other, um, that rape was forbidden about um, among the partisans. I came across some other interviews where they also talk about it, that, that partisans rape, but this were men talking about it. And they, they said, that after some partisans were shot, it actually worked, worked out there. But this was only one case. Um, but but, but you're totally right. And with all the ex examples you brought, that it um, usually didn't work. So th thank you. All right, we have many questions. So we will we'll try to, to cover as many as we can. Um, the next question I'm going to read is from chat and is from Terker Strede. 
it's a comment slash, slash question. And he's saying, Christian Erslev, church father of Danish historiography, formulated the rule that it is okay to fabulate along the sources, but not against them. But we do have a problem here, haven't we? How far can we go fabulating, interpreting the silences of the interviewees' tales? I, I think this is this is really important, and what I try to do is that, that I'm really cautious that that I say it, it it's potential, and sexualized violence, and that that this is my interpretation of 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 it, and of course we, we have to go along the lines um, of, of 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 the narrative. But I think it's also okay to to some certain extent to to to, to argue or go against. Um, the, the narrative, because um, also what, what becomes apparent in, in other sources that um, se sexualized violence was, was there and, and, and thinking about the, the situation and what, what, what we have there. I think it, it, it's to, to, to some certain extent good and important to, to approach this, this critically. All right. Uh, Julie Hurst Whitehouse is asking, um, She's interested in hearing a bit more about how you're interpreting agency in terms of sexual violence. Are you looking at examples of how women themselves express it? Um, my, my focus is, is, is on men actually, and, and I, I didn't talk about it um, so much to today actually. Um, and also with sexualized violence and male agency, I, I have to see how, how I approach this. And also to, to, to be honest, I, I don't have a good, good answer yet. Um, as, as I said in the beginning, I'm, I'm interested in, in the decisions, in the nego negotiations of, 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 of choices. Um, but how I, how I will deal with it in, in terms of sexualized violence, um, I, I, I still have to figure this out. So, so I'm sorry, I cannot say more in this regard. All right, um, I read Sayantani Yana's uh, question, which um, I, I seems to, uh, some people are uh, uh, kind of agreeing with, this, with the question. Uh, she's curious about the keywords that were used for the indexing of this particular segment of the interview that you showed us. So Begum's interview. And um, the, the, the second, the segment with the farmhouse was um, indexed as um, uh, resistant sexual act act activities. So, so it wasn't um, framed as potential se sexual assault, but I also had a really good talk uh, um, with, with Crispin Brooks and Lauren about this, because with, with the indexing at the VHA, they, they go with, with what the um, in interviewees are act actually say. So, so it, with the indexing, it, it makes sense to, to, to term it like this. Okay, good point. Um, William Jones is asking, um, so he's wondering if you have any thoughts on how the position as an agent of the partisans held by the father of the rape victim mentioned in Michael's testimony played a role in the punishment of Michael's friend, such as if the rape had occurred against a peasant who was not in any way involved with the partisans, would the punishment still have occurred? I, I, I could only speculate about it, but also how he's saying it or talking about it, because he says we, we didn't know that she was a daughter of, of, of an informant or or agent, so it, it seems that, that, that it made a difference. But also here again, I, I don't have enough material or, or sources yet to, to determine whether this was widespread or whether this was a single incident. But also referring to this other view where, where, where the, the person says that in the beginning, some male partisans were shot for, for, for rape. I can imagine that it was Follow, followed, but of course we, we don't know. And like, because they then sort of take it into their own hands and say, he's a good fighter and he, he shouldn't be killed now. So, and then I can imagine that also something like this happened more often, but I can only speculate here. All right, thank you. And I will read one more question before uh, we get to, um, oh, actually that's Georgia's hand still being raised. So let me let me read this question. Um, from an anonymous attendee uh, who says, you use the phrase perceived moral standards. 
in discussing the partisans and their definitions of sexual violence or crimes. Can you say more about how the construction of morality and sexual ethics in the context of genocidal violence influences the way you interact with the materials you, in, uh, you work with um, in your research? This is a very heavy, and but, but also um, good, 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 good question. Um, of, of, of course, the, the research we, we do is oft, oft, often personal, and it's like, I, I, I cannot say I, when, when I'm sitting down, down for work, this has nothing to do with my own experiences or, or how, how I see the world or what, what is important um, to, to, to me. So, so that this is also the case then that um, so such an inter no, no, it's not even an interpretation, but that I'm um, also I, I don't want, want to morally judge by, by myself, but but of course when I'm critiquing this or like when I'm suggesting that this is sexualized violence, that this 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 comes from my own um, can you say convic con convictions or like what I'm convinced about, but what what is important. But I I, I will think about this. Well, this isn't, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Rosanna Ramsden is uh, saying, uh, thinking about Lauren's talk a couple of weeks ago, I wonder whether you've sought out more stories about partisans as told by women that may be cataloged under different terms. Perhaps the accounts cataloged as testimonies of hiding or sexual assault. Lauren suggested in her talk that the indexing systems, can, systems can't always be taken on face value. So perhaps there are more women's stories about partisans to be found using different indexing terms. Hey, hey Rosie, um, I, I haven't done this yet, but this is a good, good, good suggestion and point. So this is something I, I, I should do. But then it's also the question again, because what also what I realized before in, 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 in the talk that I'm, I, I, I need to get my focus also back on, on, on the man um, and of course, this, I, I can do this why, why are the, the, the female um, or, or women's voices, but I think especially with the partisans, but also I have this problem in other chapters that I'm str struggling a little bit with this to, to get the, the man in the, in the focus again, if that makes sense. So thank you. All right, and it seems like Georgia re-raised her hand, so it was my mistake, apologize. Uh, so. Georgia, I will unmute you again now. You can ask your question now. All right, it seems uh, like it was a mistake. Um, so Marta, I will, let me see, just, do we have any more? Uh, yes, we do have a comment actually from Jessica Tannenbaum from earlier that I missed to read. So Jessica is saying uh, maybe she didn't mind the woman in the story uh, because it was a way of survival for her as Florian Zabransky has mentioned earlier. So it was relatively voluntary in primarily co coercive circumstances. This could be the case, um, of, of, of course, and, 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 and we don't know this, but from my perspective or from my ap ap approach to, 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 to this, I, I, I would then still suggest that it's sexualized violence. But I think we, we will never get, get to this um, like a, to a final answer because we just don't have enough information and as, especially um, the, the, the voice of the women which is missing. All right, thank you. If there are no more questions, I will hand it over back to Marta. Marta. Thank you so much, Vadema. You handled the influx of questions heroically. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, if there are no final questions, I personally want to thank everyone who attended and especially want to thank Florian. It's been such a pleasure to work with you over this past month in these remote virtual residency conditions. Um, and I will hand it back to, oh, there is one more question. One, hang on one second. It's again from Esther Myers. So I will 
um, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. As somebody who is so personally involved, I just want to make one comment, and that is, um, I personally begged my mother to give me her war story, um, and I was already in my 50s, and she was already in her 80s, and I might say that there is such an incredible disincentive for a woman to come forward either privately even in my case or definitely in the show off foundation videos and relive re-experience put up into the light the incredible humiliation of a rape or of repeated rapes and i imagine all the data that you may be able to collect would be a gross underestimation of what actually happened. Thank you for sharing that, Esther, and especially from someone for whom this history is so personal um, for you and your mother and your family. We really appreciate your, your contribution. Thank you. Regina Mulhauser has added a very useful resource to the chat, so I will just direct all of you, um, including our earlier questioner, Georgia, to the chat for a very helpful resource. Um, and I'll speak it aloud for the people who are watching the recording. For research of publications on sexual violence in armed conflict and genocide, the bibliography of the International Research Group sexual violence in armed conflict might be helpful. It also contains about 200 articles on sexual violence during the German war and the Holocaust. Thank you so much, Renita. So with that, I will, excuse me, I will turn it back over to Wolf Gruner for final comments, Wolf. You're on mute. Thank you all for this uh, uh, lively discussion. Thank you, Marta and Badema, for uh, being wonderful host, uh, hosts as always. Um, and uh, I just wanted to urge everybody to uh, uh, go uh, who has not uh, or who wants to share, for example, the recording. This will be up in a few days on our website of the Center for Advanced Genocide Research. You can Google the center very easily, Center Genocide, and we are the first hit uh, on Google. Um, and you also uh, uh, feel free to subscribe to our newsletter to be informed about uh, future events uh, which we plan to do or which we are already kind of uh, scheduled. And so thanks to everybody, especially our speaker for today, the fellow uh, Margie and Douglas Greenberg fellow, uh, Florian Sobranski. We wish him all the best for his future um, research and for the finalizing the dissertation. And I thank also the donors of this fellowship, uh, again, Margie and Douglas Greenberg, um, and for their support and uh, the co-sponsor, the Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies at USC. Um, for everybody, uh, have a good rest of the day or beginning of the, uh, of the day, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to leave the chat open for just a moment, but we'll see you at our next event, hopefully.